Hi, everybody. Welcome to the California State Railroad Museum. My name is Ty Smith, and I'm the director here. And I'm just so pleased uh, to be able to welcome you into the museum and then also to meet you where you are to tell you about um, not only the California State Railroad Museum, but really the, the stories and the amazing history um, of which we are the keepers. But make no mistake, this is your museum. This museum um, is uh, of the people. And so I really just wanna share your museum with you um, through this brief program. Um, now, uh, I know that you have limited interactivity and I cannot see and hear from everybody, but you do have a little feature on the bottom of your screen where you could raise your hand. And so I want, um, just as an experiment, people to raise their hands if you think that railroading history and trains matter in your life right now. Yeah, a lot of people, but there's probably a lot of hands that aren't up. And so one of the things we talk about all the time here, people come in and they go, oh, that train, railroading, that's ancient. That's part of the ancient past. That's part of our, our um, distant past. It doesn't, it's not relevant to my life um, here and now, but our lives collectively are made of railroad stories. It's our language. Think about um, how many times you hear people saying they are getting off track or derailed or trying to gather up a full head of steam to accomplish one task or another. Um, if you go to a baseball game, sometimes you go to a double header. That's a railroad term that um, came from putting two engines together to haul a heavy load. So our language is informed by uh, our railroad past. Music, our most iconic songs. Um, we're all leaving on a midnight train to Georgia or hearing a lonesome whistle blow way off in the distance somewhere and imagining ourselves jumping on that old box car and escaping whatever it is that makes us feel stuck. Our movies, our railroad movies, and our cities and towns were shaped by the railroad. Um, sometimes we drive through, I'm here in Sacramento, California, and sometimes you drive across town and get stuck in traffic because there's a big freight train coming through. We go, who put this train through the middle of this city? But the reality is, is that Sacramento, like most cities and towns in the West were built up around the trains, not the other way around. And so our very spatial relationship to the world in which we live, um, our, our landscapes was uh, the product of decisions that were made long before we were born. So I, I wanna make a proposition to you, an argument really, and that is to say that um, trains uh, and especially the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, the idea of linking the nation um, is really probably the, the piece of history that is most directly related to um, the global world in which we live now. And so today, really what I want to talk about is the building of the Transcontinental Railroad and how that has um, shaped the development of the nation, um, has shaped the development of the world, the global world in which we now live, and um, is still a history that's relevant to our lives, if for nothing more than um, we drive through railroad towns and then also probably um, anything that comes to your doorstep that you've ordered online, chances are it's come through a train. So it's still a very relevant history. But first, we have to start at the beginning. And we talk a lot here in California and in Sacramento about the gold rush, right? You've all probably heard it. Raise your hand if you've heard or read or learned something about the gold rush. It's a story we tell a lot, but it's also a story we don't always tell well, um, because the gold rush story in our imaginations is about a bunch of uh, wily miners coming from the East Coast and coming out to California in search of gold. But the gold rush is really a global story. It's not just people coming from the Eastern states of what was in the United States coming to California. Sure, people in Missouri saw broadsides in their towns that told of fortunes that all you had to do was come out to California, gold nuggets the size of a person's fist. And all you had to do was find your way out to California and you would become fabulously wealthy. But while people in Missouri and other places were seeing those broadsides and advertisements, so too were those same types of things showing up, but in different languages. Um, they were showing up in places like Chile and in Mexico and showing up in uh, China. And they all told the same thing. And so when gold was discovered very near here in Sacramento, up in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, the whole world rushed in. 
It was a global phenomenon, right? And so uh, what that meant was that overnight, uh, there were enough people in what was formerly Mexican California that then became briefly a territory in the United States for it to become a state. Gold was discovered really in 1949. California becomes a state in um, 1850, right? If you look on the great seal of the state of California, um, Google it, you could probably Google it right now. Uh, you'll see a couple of figures. You'll see a grizzly bear and then you'll see uh, a woman. Who is that woman? Her name is Minerva. And the reason that people in California chose her as the symbol for California is because um, in mythology, Minerva is born full grown from the god of her father. And so she emerges into life full grown. California emerges as a state full grown, fully formed, because the whole world had rushed in during the gold rush. We talk about the gold rush all the time, right? It's part of our collective history. But the gold rush was really a flash in the pan. And so really the bulk of the gold that was found here in California happened within a like eight or 10 year period. And then people looked around and said, now what? California was so far off from the rest of the nation. Right? I mean, you had to cross an entire continent that was really not you know, connected to the rest of the, the states to get to the edges of California. And so it may um, as well have been an island, California, um, because the only way you can get here is walking over deserts hot, over mountains tall, or coming in by ship. And all of it was a very difficult journey to get here. So the people who were here were going, wait a minute, we have to have a way to connect. We have to have a way to physically connect and culturally connect new California, the newest state, to the rest of the nation. And the, what they started thinking about was the idea of a transcontinental railroad. Now, I'm not gonna just talk at you all day. Um, I'm gonna show you some things here at the museum because I'm trying to bring the museum right to you. And so I'm gonna switch the camera and show you some of the exhibits that are here at the California State Railroad Museum. Now, when we talk about the development of the railroad and the transcontinental railroad, we talk about political and cultural forces. Well, one of the key political forces that was happening um, to develop the transcontinental railroad was the idea of connecting this far off nation. And one of the people behind that idea, one of the people who um, understood um, how difficult that would be was, does anybody know who this is? I'll get closer. Raise your hand if you know who this is. Yeah, lots of hands. So we all know Honest Abe Lincoln, and we think about him in the context of um, winning the American Civil War and unifying the nation. But right in the middle of the Civil War, right in the fighting of the Civil War, thousands of um, young men dying in this regional conflict between North and South. Um, he was also looking towards the future. He was looking beyond the Civil War and thinking about what would happen next. And um, right in the middle of the Civil War, he signed some very important legislation. One of, it, one of those pieces of legislation was the Pacific Railway Act. And it was the legal mechanism that allowed the government to um, provide a lot of the funding to private corporations, private businesses, to do the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And along with that, um, Rail Act was also legislation that would provide for um, connections of other types. So um, a telegraph line, for example, that would stretch along um, the railroad. And then also mail subsidies that would continue the linkage from um, west or east to west, but that would continue on into Asia and other places to collect, uh, to connect the world in a global way um, like never before. So government was thinking about those types of connections. But there were also other people who, from a business perspective, were very interested. And so if you've spent any time in California, you've probably heard names like Leland Stanford, like Stanford University, for example, or Charles Crocker. In Sacramento, we have the Charles Crocker um, or the Crocker Art Gallery, or Art Museum. So these were the big names in early California. And these were the men who made their fortunes really in mining, not in finding gold, but um, in another way, and that was mining the miners. These folks um, sold implements to those prospectors thinking they were going to come out and find easy riches, but who actually most of them did not. Most people who came during the gold rush left poor. And so these people were looking around going, well, what do we do next? The gold rush is over. What do we do from here? And they were thinking about those ways of connecting commerce. 
It's one thing to think about a transcontinental railroad um, in the abstract, and it's quite another than to do the work of um, actually finding a route. In, has anyone driven over the Sierra Nevada mountains, like up near, um, raise your hand if you've driven up um, over like say Lake Tahoe um, in that area or Donner Pass. Um, it's, the topography is amazing. I mean, you go from here in the valley to basically sea level um, to several thousand feet at the pass. And so this was a daunting task. And one of those people who was an early advocate um, almost uh, it, like they called him crazy Judah because he had this idea of building the transcontinental railroad and he said it could be done. And um, so he went about the work of uh, actually making that happen. He was um, involved in civil engineering. And so over in this part of the museum, you see our surveyor's tent. Um, and uh, they, you know, you talk about it in the abstract, but you have to find an actual route. And so people like Judah went up into the Sierra Nevada mountains to try to find the easiest route um, for a transcontinental railroad. The easiest route through the transcontinental railroad lo looks easy on paper, but it almost is impossible um, in reality. Uh, one of the things that we've added recently to the museum is not just information about Theodore Judah and the many men who surveyed uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, but we also added some information about this woman, Anna Judah. We think of the uh, women of that time, especially women of this class, um, not being terribly involved in the work of their husbands. Anna Judah was quite different than that. Uh, she wrote later, oh, oh, that I could only climb the summits of the Sierras where I stood with him those long years ago looking west and over the mighty summit stretching out and before us we could shout to the world my story. Um, Anna Judah was one of those who put on pantaloons and um, gaiters or uh, jeans and boots and went up uh, along in the Sierra and her story is now being told here at the museum. So uh, they found a route, but you need supplies and you need things and you need to get implements up there. This is one of the earliest locomotives of the Central Pacific Railroad, the railroad that was formed by the big four, the associates um, at the prompting of Judah. Uh, it's named after Governor Stanford, who was one of the governors of California and one of the associates of the big four, uh, the businessmen who uh, put some capital financing behind that um, and started building from Sacramento uh, to the east. There was another company called the Union Pacific who started building from the east to the west. They would meet somewhere and they were engaged in a heavy competition to, to see who could lay the most track because at stake was government money. For every mile of track that they laid, they received money from the government as a subsidy. Um, that was a big part of their um, business interest. By the way, there was no way and no place to build a locomotive in 1860s California. And so this piece um, was brought in by ship in pieces and then assembled here in California. How many of you have ever bought something from Ikea or Target or something and it came in a box and you had to put it all together. Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. Of course. Uh, well, they had to do the same thing with the governor Stanford. They brought it in in pieces and put it together. And they did that with a number of locomotives because they would um, use this to actually haul the implements to create um, the actual railroad. I'm gonna take you up a little bit further into the gallery. This whole area up here is meant to evoke Donner Pass. It's meant to um, give people a sense of what the landscape uh, was up there. Um, you know, some people were skeptical. I'm gonna switch cameras here so you can see me a little bit. Some folks were really skeptical about the idea that they could build a transcontinental railroad at all. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of a guy named uh, General uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. You've probably heard his name in the context of the American Civil War. Uh, before the Civil War, though, he spent a lot of time in California. 
and he was involved in early railroad enterprises here in Sacramento Valley. And of the idea of building over the Sierra Nevada mountains, he um, raised a lot of skepticism. He didn't think that it could be necessarily done. He said if it were to be done, it would be done on the backs of giants. That was the only way. Well, the Central Pacific Railroad didn't have giants. In fact, they didn't have a lot of employees. They didn't have a lot of people who were willing to engage in the very difficult and dangerous and hard work of building a railroad through and up and over the Sierra Nevada mountains. In fact, a lot of people when they started this were either engaged in the Civil War or there was also um, a huge silver rush that happened in Nevada. And so anybody who could was uh, going off into the gold fields. I wanna ask you a question out there. Um, and that is, if you knew that you can make money working on the railroad, but you knew that it would be low pay and very difficult and dangerous work, or you could try your hand at going off into Nevada, into the silver mines, and maybe you would strike it rich. Maybe you would make more money than you could ever imagine in doing that. On the one hand, you have the certainty of earning money through working on the railroad. On the other hand, you have the uncertainty. You know that you're gonna to have to work hard in mining, but you might strike it rich. You might become wealthier than you can ever imagine. Would you choose, raise your hand if you would choose hard labor working on the railroad? Some of you are raising your hand, you got a strong work ethic. Um, or, uh, okay, raise your hand if you would prefer to try your hand at finding silver in Nevada. Yeah, a lot more hands go up. Okay, so a lot of people did that. Any, any able-bodied person who wasn't engaged in the Civil War, uh, who you know, wasn't working in another capacity, fled off into the, the silver mines. There was one group of people, though, who had been here since the gold rush, um, who couldn't just go off and try their luck in the silver mines. Um, Chinese uh, immigrants who had come to California during the gold rush um, were discriminated against in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways they were discriminated against is through a foreign miners tax. And so if you um, were an Anglo who had come from uh, the Eastern United States working in the gold fields, you, whatever you found was yours. However, if you were an immigrant who came from China, say, and you found gold or silver, you would have to pay for the privilege of mining, right? And so that discrimination along with violence and other factors really did not allow for the Chinese who were here in California since the gold rush to participate in silver. So they didn't have the choice of going off and trying to strike it rich in the silver mines. They had to choose the hard work, the difficult work of building the transcontinental railroad, right? So let me show you a little bit about that. We'll spin you around. Okay, so this part of the museum deals with and talks about the Chinese contribution to building the, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. It was really difficult work. It's hard to even imagine um, now what that work was like. Um, Backbreaking. So I know what you're thinking. You're gonna build the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, it's gonna be uh, not, a, not, a not an easy task, it's gonna be difficult, but don't they have dynamite? Don't they have hydraulic drills? Don't they have all of these um, things uh, that would allow you to easily get through the, the, the granite of the Sierra Nevada mountains? And it wasn't easy. They had to um, dig tunnels, they had to fill in land to create a smooth railroad. You know the way they did that? It wasn't through dynamite, it wasn't through hydraulic drills. It was through um, hand drills. Let me show you one. So what I'm holding in my hand is the implement that got the transcontinental built. At the end here, you see this kind of plus sign, it looks like a Phillips screwdriver, a very large one. That's, this is called a star drill. And it's as tall as I am, taller in fact. And it weighs about, I don't know, 40 or 50 pounds. Um, imagine um, picking up a five gallon bottle of water, like those big five gallon water jugs. Can you imagine that? Um, that's how much this thing weighs. And the job um, was simple uh, in idea, and that is you drove this thing into the mountain, but it was very difficult in terms of its task, right? This thing's very heavy. I'm not exaggerating my, my grunts here. So 
if you were a Chinese rail worker, perhaps your job was to hold the drill. And what that would entail is you would hold this thing up to the rock face of a of solid granite mountain. And um, behind you would be one of your best friends. Hopefully, hopefully you liked each other. Because as you held this thing to the wall, the person behind you would swing a sledgehammer as hard as they could and hit this into the granite wall. Then you'd rotate it a quarter turn. And then another person behind you would hit it as hard as he could. And then you'd rotate it again and then hit it again. Clank, bang, clank, bang, clank, bang, over and over and over and over again. And you probably did that for 14 or 16 hours a day. You probably did that six days a week. That was your job, day in and day out. They would, these star drills, they would ship them in by the hundreds. They would wear out over time. Sometimes they would measure progress in digging through Sierra Granite in inches a day. There was one tunnel, it's called the Sun Summit Tunnel, and you, like, you could Google Earth it, I think. Um, uh, it's up near Donner and, and Donner Pass. That individual tunnel took 18 months to drill. And this meant men were working, like men were working on it in shifts. And in fact, they were not only working on it in shifts, they, they, were, they were drilling from one side to another. So one crew was, was drilling from west to east and another crew, because it was taking so long, started drilling from west to east. The idea is they'd meet in the middle, but they were taking so long, um, they actually dug a shaft in the middle of that tunnel and then lowered rail workers down in there to start working on the faces inside. So at one point they were working on four faces of this tunnel and it took them a year and a half um, to build. Did I mention how cold it was? Did you see some of the snow and stuff in the background uh, in our set here at, at the museum? Um, imagine the coldest you've ever been. And then imagine working in those conditions day in and day out through the winters. Imagine the hottest you've ever been. And imagine holding this big old star, star drill day in and day out for years. And this is the work that they did. Now, um, the Chinese rail worker were not, um, you know, we have historical documents that speak to this history. We have historical documents that um, tell us what the experience was like for, say, um, Irish rail workers. We don't have a lot of personal stories or narratives from the Chinese men who worked in building the railroad, the Chinese men who toiled and gave their lives to building the railroad, this very dangerous job. You can see here, this person's um, passing up a keg of black powder. While they didn't have dynamite, the reason they were dr um, drilling all those holes was so that they could pack them full of black powder and use that little um, explosive assistance to try to create um, more fissures and, and flake off more of the rock, right? So it was a dangerous job and it was a loud job, but we don't know exactly what their experience was because they did not have um, written, you know, they certainly wrote, they certainly sent um, remittances and money back home to their families because part of what they were doing here in California was trying to provide a better life for their families back home. Um, and so they wrote letters. It's not that they didn't. It's just that we don't have any of them that remain. None of them um, were um, saved. They were probably destroyed um, throughout the years. And so we don't really have a lot of firsthand information about what that Chinese rail worker experience was like. But we do have some other kinds of histories that speak to some of their experience. And that is the um, documentation of archeology. span um, Because everywhere these camps went, you know, um, some of you have maybe seen a show on TV called Hell on Wheels. That's what they called those moving um, railroad workers camps. And um, just like any uh, laborers, um, any people who work, um, they ate and drank and laughed and told stories and shared. Um, 
And what that meant is they moved along, they left a very rich archeological record that gives us some insight into their daily lives, um, what they consumed. Um, and so here you have some of those artifacts that are part of the museum's collection. Um, it turns out that if you were a Irish rail worker that you got paid, part of your salary was room and board. And so you, they would put you in a tent and they would feed you um, there. Not so for the Chinese. Chinese got paid less than other workers and they had to buy their own food. And so a lot of what you are seeing are the vessels in which rice and tea and other um, things that the Chinese rail workers consumed were shipped over um, from Asia to California for their use and their consumption um, in the camps. And so we do have some sense of what their lives were like. Um, it is true that their lives were very difficult. It's true that it was very dangerous, but it's also true like all of us who go through hard times um, in our work um, that they found time for joy and laughter and community. And we know that um, through the things that they consumed and the things they shared. We also have another kind of history that tells us a lot about the life of the railroad workers. We have um, descendant stories and we have them featured here at the museum. We have these stories that speak to the way um, those experiences were passed down through oral tradition, through um, memory. Um, and there are a number of people today who are descendants of these Chinese rail workers um, all over the state. Um, and they come here to the museum to share their um, oral histories and experiences, the things that were passed down to them from um, grandparents and great grandparents, and the things that they're passing down to their children and grandchildren that tell us about those experiences um, of the railroad workers. Um, it took many years uh, to build through the Sierra. It was a monumental task. Uh, I mentioned that Sherman, the famed Civil War general, uh, said that if it was to be done, if the building of the Transcontinental Railroad was to happen, that it would be the work of giants. As it turned out, it was the work of people who had giant ambition and giant hearts and toiled um, to contribute to the joining of the nation. I want to take you a little bit further up into the museum and talk about what happened after the building of the Transcontinental Railroad a little bit. Um, what happens when there's no longer a need for thousands of rail workers? Are there jobs for them? And the answer was yes and no. Many of the men who toiled on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad would go on to work on other rail projects throughout the world, um, in Australia and the Canadian Transcontinental Railroad. And in fact, the second Transcontinental Railroad that went through a southern route here in the United States. Um, other of the men, especially the Chinese rail workers, um, would come down into the Sacramento Valley and build um, not railroads, but the Delta and the levees and the system um, that now protects us from the seasonal flooding of the Sacramento River. Raise your hand if you live uh, in the valley or live in Sacramento or in, in this region in the valley. See some hands going up. Um, your life um, today, uh, the fact that it doesn't flood, your house doesn't flood every year now is a direct result of the reclamation work, the filling in of the, of the seasonal floodlands of the valley and making it into some of the richest agricultural land in the world right? um, is a product of Chinese workers who turned the back from the backbreaking work of building the Transcontinental Railroad to doing the backbreaking work of filling in land where there was not. But they also faced a lot of discrimination because once that big job was done, there was a sense that American jobs should be for Americans, not for others. And so what we talk about in the museum too is the difficult history, um, the politics of exclusion, the politics of division, and some of the darker chapters in our own history where the people who, the very people who built the Transcontinental Railroad, the very people who connected the world were then alienated 
um, from it um, were, were said that they were no longer needed. And so we talk about that as well um, in, our, in our histories. And that's something that was also passed down um, throughout that. I'm gonna take you in um, further into the museum here. And maybe we'll end uh, with a look at what happened on the day. We just had what's called the sesquicentennial. That's a fancy word for 150 years anniversary of the joining of the Transcontinental Railroad, which happened in, uh, on, in May 1869, uh, May 10th. Although uh, it was advertised that it was gonna happen on May 8th, but it was delayed by a couple of days. Um, Sacramento celebrated anyway on May 8th, but the nation really celebrated on May 10th. Um, let me bring the camera down here a little bit and see if you can see. You see that there? So raise your hand if you can see a mock-up of railroad tracks. So on that day uh, in 1869, um, the Chinese rail workers from the Central Pacific Railroad uh, lay, brought in the last rail, and Irish workers from the Union Pacific Rail brought in the other side, and they got it all set up. And then they got out of the way. And then a bunch of dignitaries came in. And they gave speeches, and they talked about progress, and they talked about what this would do for the nation. And they took a ceremonial mallet and a couple of real, like, gold spikes. And actually one was a silver spike representing the different Western states. And in that laurel tie, ceremonial tie, um, they tapped in the final spikes that joined the road. And then somebody picked up what's called a telegraph key. And they used, how many of you text message frequently and obsessively? I know I do. But they had this key and it was like, like an early version of text messaging because it was a, a series of codes that was transmitted over wire. And into that, uh, they typed in this code, this series of codes. And what those dots and dashes meant to the people who understood that coded language was simply the word done. All of that work, that political work, that actual work, that physical work of joining the Transcontinental Railroad was at last done. And then everybody queued up for a photo. Can you see it? Raise your hand. This is one of the many photos that was taken that day. Look at the people that you see in there. Who's there? And who's missing? Who are there are the dignitaries and the engineers and the people from that region and who's missing from most of those photos were the Chinese rail workers, were the Irish rail workers who did all of that work in creating the Transcontinental Railroad. So what did it mean to say that it was done, those dots and, dots and dashes? What it meant was that the nation was unified physically, right? The, the actual physical joining of the nation had occurred through rail. It also meant that because of the um, sort of parallel technology of the teletype, that we could transmit across the nation in seconds, in minutes, what used to take months. It meant that instead of coming through a wagon train across the prairie lands 
um, of the middle of the nation and it taking three or four months or getting on a ship in New York and sailing around South America and coming into California, that you could get on a train and in a week do what used to take several months to do. It literally bound the nation in a way that it had not been before. It also, um, at the end of the Civil War, tied together the fragile nation um, in another way, uh, in, in more of a philosophical way. Um, it meant that you didn't live just off in far off California or the, the traditional states in the East, that, that all of a sudden the whole continent was connected. But also because of mail subsidies, because part of that legislation was to allow for that, it meant that California, the railroad ended in Sacramento, but the steamship continued from Sacramento into San Francisco. And those steamships continued beyond San Francisco to um, Japan and China. And so it collect, like we live in a global world. We're globally connected. We're globally connected through, um, through airplanes. We're globally connected through information and the internet. This was the beginning of that, the, the world in which we now live. Um, we live in the world that the railroad made. We live in the world of the transcontinental railroad. And it was at that moment that the globe was connected in a way that it was never before. You probably, in your learning as students, talked about the European explorers. You talked about um, people looking for easy routes across the globe, people looking for things like a Northwest Passage. What the joining of the Transcontinental Railroad did was finally realize that four or 500 year old vision of connecting the globe in a way, it just so happens that it wasn't a waterway that they found, it was, it was a way that they created in steel, but really connected the globe um, in a way that it had never been before. Our lives um, really are made of railroad stories. Um, this was just one of those stories. There are many other stories um, to tell, but I'm so happy to have been able to share um, the story of the connection of the Transcontinental Railroad because it really is um, a history that connects us, a history um, that is universal to all of us and a very diverse history. Um, everybody has a parent or a grandparent who worked on the railroad. Um, because it was one of the largest in industries um, for so long. So we really are a railroad people. Now I asked you at the beginning of the talk, uh, how many of your lives you felt were affected by the railroads? How many of you um, think that railroad history matters to your life? How many of you now, having heard this and learning a little bit about the history of building of the Transcontinental Railroad, feel that this history matters, that these events matters, uh, matter to your life um, and our development? Nice. Um, thank you so much for spending a little time with me. We'll do, do more of these um, as the, the days go on. And if you want to learn more about um, railroad history, I would invite you to connect with us on social media. Look for the California State Railroad Museum on Instagram and on Facebook. If you have any questions um, from today's talk, um, personally for me or the staff here at the museum, um, we're all ears. Uh, this is your museum after all, and we want to do everything we can uh, to bring it right to you. Um, uh, in this time. So thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to hearing from you all in the future. Um, be well, take care of each other. Bye-bye.